So people hypothesized there must be an extra planet beyond Uranus. Now, we had no evidence of this yet. The telescope wasn't strong enough to, to perceive it. But 100 years later, we discovered the planet that the equation predicted, which was Neptune. And so what you see going on here is the mathematics isn't just something we impose upon the world, but it's actually describing the fundamental structure of the world. It, it makes predictions that we then go out and confirm. What you're telling me and telling our audience is, look, this isn't something we're just making up. We're seeing math in the very fabric yes. of the universe. So does that mean math is the language of God? Yeah, yeah, so that's what Galileo said. When God created, he used the language of mathematics. Right? Let's talk about math now. Why does math, why do math patterns show up in nature? Well, first let me give you an example of it. You have that pineapple over there, right? Mm -hmm. So if you grab that pineapple, okay. and in this pineapple, if you hand it to me really fast, okay. you can see you have two different kinds of spirals. Your spirals going this way, and spirals going this way. So if we count the spirals going this direction, okay. we're gonna lock it in with my thumb. Okay. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then back to my thumb. So eight spirals going that direction. All right. Now we're going to count the spirals going the other direction. Okay. So I'm gonna lock it in with my thumb. One here, two, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and back where I started. All right. So eight one direction, 13 the other. Okay. Incredible. Right. So why is that incredible? Yes, I'm so, still waiting for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so eight and 13 are special numbers in mathematics. Okay. They show up in something called the Fibonacci sequence. You heard of that before? Yes. So Fibonacci is where you begin with one and one, and then each next number is the sum of the previous two. So one and one gives you two, one and two gives you three, two and three gives you five, three and five gives you eight, and five and eight gives you 13. The Fibonacci numbers show up in the pineapple. And it doesn't just show up in the pineapple. Grab that sunflower. If you look at the spirals of the inside of a sunflower and count them, you get Fibonacci numbers. You get 34 going one direction and 55 going the other direction, which are the next two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. And it's not just pineapples and sunflowers. You can look at pine cones, they show up there. You can look at galaxies. You can look at seashells. The Fibonacci numbers show up across the universe. So you're seeing math patterns, and especially as a math professor, I'm good you're able to see this. You're, you're, you're seeing math patterns throughout our world, throughout the universe. What is that telling you? Right. So when mathematicians talk about this and physicists, for example, Eugene Wigner was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and he wrote a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. And throughout this paper, when he looks at the fact that mathematics shows up throughout the world, he calls it miraculous. A dozen times in this paper, he used the word miraculous to describe it. And so here's a scientist wrestling with the fact that somehow mathematics describes the universe, he throws out all the scientific vocabulary and uses the theological word miraculous to describe it. So for me, when I listen to mathematicians and physicists wrestle with this, it's such a clear signpost to the fact that there is a creator. Now, some people might say, wait a minute, you're saying math is discovered, but I think math is created or invented. What would you say to those people? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a bit of both, right? Um, when Isaac Newton looked at the data for the, how the planets orbit and came up with this universal law of gravitation, right? He, he used notation that he had um, invented to describe the orbit of the planets. He comes up with his law of gravitation. But he's not imposing something onto the world. He's actually discovering something about the world. Mm. And the way we know this is he discovers this in the 1600s. In the 1700s, we find a new planet, Uranus. And when Uranus was discovered, it didn't quite fit the equation of Isaac Newton. Mm. His equation seemed to be wrong. Mm. But then people realized, well, it could fit the equation if there was something else pulling on Uranus, pulling it a little bit further so it's just quite, not quite exactly what the equation said from, from this one perspective. But if you include this extra planet, it would fit the equation. So people hypothesized there must be an extra planet beyond Uranus. Now, we had no evidence of this yet. The telescope wasn't strong enough to, to perceive it. But 100 years later, we discovered the planet that the equation predicted, which was Neptune. And so what you see going on here is the mathematics isn't just something we impose upon the world, but it's actually describing the fundamental structure of the world. It, it makes predictions that we then go out and confirm. What you're telling me and telling our audience is, look, this isn't something we're just making up. We're seeing math in the very fabric yes. of the universe. So does that mean math is the language of God? Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's what Galileo said. When God created, he used the language of mathematics, right? And people have wrestled with why is the universe so mathematical? And some have tried to resist concluding God. There's a professor at MIT. He concludes the reason that the universe is mathematical is because the universe is just a mathematical object. You and I are mathematics that are somehow self-conscious and alive. And it's kind of an absurd, uh, ridiculous theory, but it's showing the, the lengths to which people are wrestling with the fact that there's this deep structure to the world. When I talk to my physicist friends about this, I, I have one friend who's a physicist, um, comes from a secular background, um, doesn't have any Christian commitments, but he told me that this is what keeps him up at night. Why is there this mathematical structure? This keeps me up at night. And then he says, I know how you as a Christian make sense of it. Hmm. So he as a secular you know, physicist can look at me and say, I know how you as a Christian, he sees how it points to God, hmm. right? And so it's not just something that, that you read into it, but it's actually the structure of the world is strong evidence that there is a creator. That's really incredible. Uh, this is the first time I'm getting excited about math right now. You know, when you think about the, the theories behind how this universe came about, yeah. the majority of scientists say, well, there was this Big Bang. Before that, there was this, you know, essentially this, the laws of physics were broken down, mm. the singularity, and then some quantum fluctuation, and boom, the universe began. Stephen Hawking said, no, we don't need any kind of creation or mm. origin. Mm. The laws of gravity have always been there. Yeah. And then you got the multiverse theory out there that especially superhero movies are really yeah, interested yeah, 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 in, yeah. right? And then there's theism. Mm. Based upon your study of mathematics, let's lay aside the church, yeah, let's yeah, lay yeah. aside the Bible. Which of those makes much more sense and is inconsistent with the data of mathematics? Yeah. So from much of human history, we just assumed the universe always existed, right? The ancient Greeks, they thought it was always here. And that's why is the universe said it's always been here, right? But the discovery of cosmology is the universe had a beginning. And so now how do we make sense of the fact the universe had a beginning? Um, the Big Bang Theory is just the recognition that there was an initial point of time. Now, one way to try to explain how the universe had a beginning is to try to appeal somehow the laws of physics. This is what Stephen Hawking claims. He says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But when I think about what the law of gravity is, it's just a mathematical description of the world. Right? Do you have a wallet on you? I don't. I wish yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you think about pull out your wallet, you can use mathematics to describe how much money you have. You know, maybe it's like a 20 and a 5, 25, mathematics describes it. But you can't scribble down plus 100 and have $100 pop into existence. Right? I mean, that'd be great if you could. But mathematics doesn't have creative power. It only has descriptive power. So when people think that the laws of physics can somehow create the world, it, it's a confusion. The laws of physics are just describing how the world works. It can't describe what actually created the universe. Mm. And so I think the fact the universe had a beginning coheres so well with the biblical story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? For thousands of years, the biblical text said it, and now science is catching up and we can see indeed there was a beginning to the universe. Well, let me push back a little mm -hmm. bit here. Here you are, you're saying, wait a minute, I think theism is the best answer. Mm -hmm. God created this universe, right? But how do we know which God? I mean, mm -hmm. for the Hindus, they got Brahma, right? Yeah. You got, for the Muslims, they got Allah. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to the Norse gods, you can go to the Greek, get into the Titans and Zeus mm -hmm. or whoever, right? Mm -hmm. But why do you think the Christian God yeah seems to be the most reasonable mm -hmm. source behind this, this universe. Yeah. So one of the unique things about the biblical text is that it doesn't give a story of where God came from. If you compare the account of Genesis with that of the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Egyptians, they all have theogenies, which are stories of where the gods came from. That originally there was chaos or there was water or there was darkness or whatever the original material was. And then from that, the gods emerge. And so the gods themselves have origin stories. Nature creates God. That's right. But what you see in Genesis is the opposite. In the beginning, God, it's just God. And then God creates everything, the heavens and the earth. And what we now see is indeed nature has a beginning, right? So if nature has a beginning, then you can't have God coming out of nature. And so I see what's going on in the biblical text is has been confirmed now, the fact that there's a beginning to the universe. Uh, Dr. Bosman, let me come at, at another angle, but yeah. how do you know God doesn't have a, a beginning. If, if we're going to apply yeah, yeah. the idea of something with the cause and, and beginning, why don't we apply that to God? Why is God immune yeah. from this beginning? Aren't we going into this problem of infinite regress? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, if God created the universe, then who created God? Some right. people ask this, right? Um, the reason we want to explain what created the universe is because the universe had a beginning. Right? The fact we can look at the cosmological evidence and see the universe is expanding. You play that story in reverse. If it's expanding, you go back to those initial points. 
But it's only because the universe had a beginning that you ask what created the universe. The, the belief in the Christian God isn't a belief of a God that had a beginning. Psalm 90 verse two says God is from everlasting to everlasting, mm-hmm. right? God is without beginning. God is necessary. There, there's nothing else that explains the existence of God. So believing in a God that had as a beginning is not the Christian God. We call that an idol. That's a false God, right? Now, let's, since we're talking about God and eternity, let's talk about eternity, right? Yeah, you yeah. have an explanation let's behind why we have this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, when we talk about big numbers, okay. a million, a billion, a trillion, a lot of times they just all sound the same to us, right? What is a million? What is a billion? You know, some of us maybe have a million dollars, but most of us, they're just big numbers. So I wanted to visualize what some of these big numbers are. So if you open that bag of sugar, okay. I, I did the calculation this morning. In a bag of sugar, I'm not going to ask you to count them. It'll take too long. Yeah. But there's about a million grains of sugar in there. Okay. So if you pour it out in here, we can see what a million, a million looks like. Now, as you pointed out, how long would it take you, you think, to actually count those one by one by one? Oh, uh, several lifetimes. Yeah. Well, it's not too long. If you take one per second to count up to a million, it would take about 11 and a half days. So just shy of two weeks. Okay. So if you have two weeks that you're free, you can just count through those grains of sugar and you can get up to a million. By the way, this is only something mathematicians think about. Right. That's know? right. <laughs> now, if instead of counting to a million, you want to get up to a billion, it's going to be a lot more than this. It's going to be a thousand of those, right? If you get up to a billion, how long do you think it would take you to count to a billion? I can't even compute yeah. that. So if you're doing one number per second, it would be about 32 years. Okay. I just celebrated my billionth birthday a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so 32 years is a billion seconds. Now, these are big numbers, right? But compared to eternity, right? If you think of each of these instead of being a second, a year, hmm. this is your life. Hmm. That's 80 little years, right. right? And that's compared to a million. Right. But compared to eternity, this is, this is nothing. So the, the um, mathematician Blaise Pascal, he was a mathematician, a theologian, he reflected on eternity and he said, you know, so often we think about the present and we magnify the present as if it's everything. We're thinking about what we do tonight, what we do this weekend, everything about the present. But, but at the same time, we never think about eternity. We never think about the whole. He says, by doing so, we magnify the present to make it everything, and we diminish eternity to make it nothing. Mm-hmm. And so what, it, what mathematics teaches me is it reminds me that, okay, let's keep things in perspective, right? Let's keep just the moment of our life in perspective of the rest of eternity. Mm. That's really incredible, and I appreciate you helping us to, yeah. to, to zoom out mm. and see the bigger picture. You know, speaking of eternity, and we think about God, I mean, eternity is one of those things, it's like you keep going back before the creation of this world, mm. you go back before the creation of this, you know, the angels, and you keep going back in your mind before God had created anything, before there was anything that was a creature or anything that was part of created order, and we get back to when it was just God. Right. What was God doing from eternity past? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's hard to wrestle with because whenever you think of God, you might think of like God in heaven. But as you said, even the angels had a beginning, right? Even God's throne, it's it, just God. What is that ultimate reality? As I've grappled with this, there's a line of Jesus that's helped me. Um, Jesus prays in John 17. So towards the end of his life, coming to the cross, Jesus prays to the Father and he says, Father, you loved me from before the foundation of the world. Mm. And so the picture there is there's just God, but the Christian conception of God is God is rich. God exists as three persons, as Father, Son, and Spirit. And so from eternity past, God existed in love relationship, the Father loving the Son. When Jesus thinks back to eternity past, he said, you loved me. And so the thing that fills eternity in the Christian view is God's love. Mm. And that's what filled eternity past, and then that's what fills eternity future, mm. right? Sometimes I think about, what am I gonna do forever, right? If I take seriously the claim that Christ gives us eternal life, like there's some cool math that we can do, right? But, but only for so long, what is gonna fill that eternity? And for the Christian, it's that we get caught up in the love of God. The same thing that filled eternity past, God's love fills eternity future. And what you're telling us is, look, it may be, it may be difficult to comprehend, but God was in relationship. I think it's good for us to think about this because so often we get caught up thinking this is what it is, reality, right? Like, like this material stuff is reality. And therefore my life should be about accumulating nice material things right. or, or whatever it might be. But it's like actually rea- like all of material reality is just a blimp compared to the eternity that preceded it. Mm. And so when you zoom out even further now, right? You zoom out like all, all of this that's material, that is just such a small moment compared to the greater fundamental reality of God's love. And so that means the things that should be about in this world 
our relationships. It's about the love of God, showing that to people, right? Things that endure, things that will last forever. 